time frame and write our own Phil Garrison that everybody knows. And um, this is the last, um, the last, uh, well, intellectual and artistic um, presentation that we have on campus uh, organized by the Latino and Latin American Studies program. So I am very happy to have Phil and to, so he can talk us about his newest book, What That Thing Said to Jesus. So he's going to enlighten us with his ideas and with his, uh, with the, with the, with the main idea that um, was the driving force for the writing of this book. So thank you to all of you for being here, and we'll start as soon as we get this running. So thank you for okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. He's into this thing here. The first thing I want to know is that the first <coughs> sentence of the book says, this is a book about mixed feelings. Fair enough. Um, at this age, I guess I'd say that's either all I have left or all I'm interested in writing about is mixed feelings. And in particular, uh, the book follows uh, the mixed feelings my immigrant neighbors and I have for where we came from. But of that, more in a while. Let's talk now about uh, Washington State. Entered the Union in 1892 and has suffered ever since from the vague inferiority complex you would expect of a state that shares a name with its nation's capital, no matter if that state does lie on the opposite edge of a wide continent. Identity theft was inevitable. Washington, D.C. has always leached importance out of Washington State and with a tricky local effect. Everything out here is already premiered somewhere else. Everything feels secondhand, derivative, style, slang. Our fads are all imports. Even the strains of weed people grow in their closets come up from Humboldt County of California. <laughs> Maybe more to the point, though, is that the eastern half of the state, where I live, is spectacularly nondescript, a land of extremes so great that over time they erase the distinctive features from our buildings and personalities. Our half of the state is made of counties that politicians drew up and gave names like Grant, Adams, and Franklin. They never had the timber and fishing that made coastal counties wealthy. Our half of the state is mainly the Columbia Plateau, or Basin, a slightly depressed basalt formation marked with valleys formed by prehistoric lake beds. The human population is sparse. Irrigation in the 20th century allowed the formation of hop yards and orchards, and in time when railroads connected, scruffy towns like Yakima and Wenatchee began to appear, nodes of cheap seasonal labor and of year-round human misery. Curiously, however, in contrast to the place names of Oregon, place names in Washington sound exotic, even alien. Washington's equivalent of Portland, for example, is Seattle. Contrast Albany and Tacoma. Malaria-bearing mosquitoes, legend has it, couldn't survive north of the Columbia River, the border between the two states. Therefore, while the Willamette Valley saw 80 and 90 percent mortality rates among native people, the generations that survived in Washington guaranteed that more native place names would pass into English. Contrast the names of Salem and Yakima, Eugene and Wenatchee. Consider Cleelum and Puyallup, Walla Walla, Tacoma, Squim, Tenasket. Washington is full of place names, full of place names nobody can pronounce in the original. Well, maybe not quite nobody. A visiting writer once remarked that Washington place names disrupt your thinking like a pebble in your Birkenstock with flashes of Neolithic life. In response, a neighbor, herself an enrolled Yakima, confessed that her own thinking was more disrupted by the fact that power hereabouts was wielded by white guys named Maggie and Scoop and Slade and Brock and Sid and Booth and Tub and Slam and Doc. Important disclosure. 
I myself am a relatively recent arrival. For that matter, I have to admit that even now, after 45 years here, out on my back deck on July 4, my own origins go mythic on me. I'll sit out back analyzing U.S. history using a clothes pin for a roach holder. After a while, I'm ready to bet the founder of the line I descend from, the very first one of us, the Ur Hillbilly, a very long time ago, rode into some town, paused and said, Lord, are you with me? And then a voice said, fucking hey. You can fill in the rest of my thinking. Talk about hillbilly traits. When 20,000 fierce, standoffish, unrelenting rubes attended Andrew Jackson's first inaugural and broke through the restraining cable into the White House with muddy boots and tobacco spit, withdrawing only when bathtubs of punch were served on the lawn, Hillbilly Deeds lit up a whole new corner of the national imagination. A lot of people recognized each other at that moment. They were poor and rural, mainly from remote areas in border states or descended from people who were. The hard to get to upland areas marked by the thin rocky soil that was all that was left when their kind of people showed up. Too underfinanced to acquire a scrap of what a later age would identify as American dreams. As time went on, they pruned orchards and picked fruit and worked construction and waited tables and made ends meet. To think of yourself as a hillbilly after all these generations calls for a slippery balance of detail and context. The kind of mental acrobatics historians bring to bear on the study of pastoral writing by which I mean not skits about shepherds, no Neil Wordsworthian notes about fresh air, but rather writing about the, uh, life outside of population centers, out here where people feel out of focus, if not invisible. Life outside of population centers, somewhere bony ranchers yawn over 8 a.m. coffee and talk about their tweaker grandkids. In that context, the word hillbilly comes off as an antique, as a slur that survived to become an epithet to be proud of or at least ignored. Everyone agrees that it used to imply you were cunning, impatient, a chronic oversimplifier of nuance, captive to feeling sad and cheap and fake, capable of insane courage, of treachery, of politics in the form of grudges and more treachery. The word used to stick to you like a birthmark. The people in question recognized each other, according to them, through layers of affectation and fine talk. Nowadays, walk through any local trailer for us, hillbillies got some kind of radar for each other, a woman in a baseball cap will observe. She is running a yard sale. Her tone makes it clear that life is a grudging, off-the-cuff cooperation with forces more powerful than you are and that the right kind of man or woman can survive disaster and have something to show for it. Pursuit of happiness is the phrase that comes to mind. No wonder hillbillies are risk addicts. No guts, no glory. For that matter, recall the composition of the prototypical hillbilly hymn. The way the thing came into being, frankly, says worlds about those of us who sing it. Trapped by a storm, tucking himself away in a cleft of the Mendip Hills Gorge, the Reverend Augustus Montague Top Lady then emerged, it was 1763, and wrote Rock of Ages. By now, of course, after 10 or 12 generations, the notion of what a hillbilly is has diluted. By now it is only, for many people, a vague aftertaste. A century ago, however, while our national media took form. The flavor was utterly distinctive and central and compelling. The first Hollywood action films were set not in the West, but rather in Appalachia, where guys in bib overalls, scruffy beards, one gallus undone, blazed away at each other in a manner which recalled the sort of neighborly give and take favored 30 years before by Hatfields and McCoys. Not surprisingly, by the way, all that filmy gunplay turned real in my parents' hometown, Republic, Missouri, in 1932, when Harry and Jennings Young 
dispatched a then record six law enforcement officers in a single afternoon. So what is my own particular perspective? Well, it is framed by geography and history, by places and times. Specifically, I am a creature of the United States, which runs from the Mississippi west to the oceans, prairies, plains, foothills, mountain passes, basin and range country, more mountain passes. Everybody knows the sequence. There are a lot of what people call natural wonders out here. Extravagant displays of what wind and water and stone can bring off given time. Hell's Canyon, Devil's Slide. The names reflect one prevailing reaction of the first Euro Americans to pass through. Only that, pardon me, that only diabolic forces would unwrench a landscape like the, this one. But many other people saw the landscape as merely awesome, whether it testified to the powers of God or of geology. All agreed it was pristine, untouched, fresh. It bore no identifying marks, no streets, no cathedrals, no plazas, no statues, nothing to indicate that anyone had ever lived here. So let's jump ahead for a moment. And let's talk about us now. When a local freezer plant shuts down and neighbors move out, it reminds us that we owe a lot of our population drift to corporate decisions made a continent away. Just as when orchards and vineyards begin to climb the slope of Umtainum Ridge, we remember that no other part of the country rides a boom and bust economy quite as fiercely as our own West, Nuestro Querido Norte, nor with quite as much glee and opportunism. The truth is that impersonal fevers of supply and demand, highly contagious, fickle as gods, run through our trailer parks and truck stops, and we wouldn't have it any other way. Our basin and range, high step, big sky country is in fact a landscape so harsh, so inhospitable, that not until post-Civil War corporations and the millions they could invest did it yield an income. And then it paid off only in the form of highly mechanized farming and mining and blogging operations. Everybody knows the story how investors got rich and field hands and miners and loggers, their livelihood dependent on bottom lines calculated at a desk 3,000 miles away. As time went on, the national iconography came into play as well as a lot of irony. The landscape that Hollywood forever associated with pioneer independence, with having enough elbow room to start life all over, this part of the country, in other words, since the railroads arrived, has been a corporate plaything. Massive agricultural and mining projects create interlocking colonies, which in turn are controlled by absentee CEOs who answer to nameless stockholders. Um, by now, it is almost routine. I mean the occasional operation by agents from Immigration and Customs Enforcement fully backed up by a helicopter and 30-some local law enforcement personnel. After the sort of raid people lived through last January, the whole parqueadero goes into convulsions, 25 or 30 trailers abandoned with homework left on the kitchen table. A four-year-old con asthma turned purple at the sight of those guys drawn weapons, of her teenage brother handcuffed, shirtless and goose bumps in the front yard. The mother's eyes glaze when she talks about it. Her voice drops, almost in wonder. One ballpoint pen signature a thousand miles away? Yeah, it's too full. You disappear. Her thinking hesitates. Think of crossing a frozen sidewalk a step at a time. That night, at the jailhouse door, uh, $5,000 worth of lawyer descends with a shrug from a Lexus SUV. My God, quit whimpering. You aren't the only late this ever happened. Three months later, the Ospreys are back. It is late April, and now they occupy the plywood platform the power company put up on a pole right down the road. They have a 20-foot length of what looks like twine and feathers, and maybe the orange of hay baling twine, all knotted and tangled, dangling over one side of the nest. 
Cressy or ratfish? Can't decide. A white head shows above the nest edge. The other adult is a phone pole away, eyeing a field two inches high in Timothy. Every April, they take up residence in that nest on that platform, having wintered in South America. Though, of course, I don't recognize them as individuals. Can't swear these are the same pair as last year, though ospreys do make for life. The migration analogy draws itself. What we call immigration out here is nothing more or less than a few million poor people moving from one place to another in pursuit of hard, monotonous, ill-paid work. No doubt Congress sees it in terms of numbers and well-formed anecdotes, but we live in it. We breathe it from the atmosphere. It greets us at cash register or from a neighbor's yard. It approaches with dinner plate and bedpan in hand. And immigration has changed us. We've gotten used to being around terribly vulnerable neighbors in their wary, deer-like cynicism. The random risk at any moment of disappearance and deportation guarantees that in a certain number of us inhabit an openly totalitarian state. And that anxiety flavors everything out here. But I was talking about the Ospreys. Sometimes I try to imagine the perspective it would take to know an individual osprey, intimately, I mean, to know it as well as I know the miniature Alaskan husky at my heels. Imagine the perspective it would take to observe one single osprey, year by year, while it migrated 3,000 miles. The patience to keep watching until you recognize the equivalent in it of playfulness or fear of boredom or anger. Not surprisingly, that perspective is what my neighbors ascribe to God. Call it that business about noting the fall of a sparrow. Call it something imagined into place by calm but desperate men and women, by people at the mercy of forces so capricious, so impersonal, that life itself is mainly nuance. Meanwhile, on I-82, between anonymous long-haul trailers and two trailers hauling apple bins and one vulnerable pickup, here comes my own 2001 cracked windshield Camry. An uncomfortable moment transpires when we pass going the other way with tinted glass all around it, a huge shiny black bus without a single identifying mark. Nobody says anything. Nobody has to say anything. The sagebrush whizzing by, bits of uh, blue sky and osprey nest, swell and drop off of ravines, bank, curve, tread, vibrator, all the familiar images no longer feel so familiar. Not with buses like that on the road. After all, as a metaphor representing contemporary life itself, this whole business of borders is trite but accurate. Not that I stay awake thinking about borders, but yes, indeed. Imaginary lines do separate, separate people, and all borders viewed up close are portable. And borders, at least in the United States, are simply one more way of making money off poor people. All of that is true, and yet, living on land that, during the last century, has been ground zero for two massive human migrations, that of hillbillies headed from border states to the west, and that of Mexicanos headed to the north, along with the zillions of border mutations each has brought about. All that leaves me little inclined to speculation and a lot more caught up in the local details of being from somewhere else. But let me get specific. A century's worth of accumulated human turnover, I have to admit, has a peculiar effect on the way I talk. Friends say that my speech is studied with local expressions, native turns of phrase, but from somewhere else. I love it when a colleague from Texas says we might could have a meeting next week, or another from Colombia instead of adios, says ciao. A couple of times a week, by the way, and this is my <coughs> all-time favorite localism, I hear one Mexicano neighbor warn another that a car is coming or that a ladder is falling. Any 
indeed anything unanticipated is about to occur, by interjecting the word aguas. Literally, it means waters. But popular etymology has this usage originating in Spain in the centuries before indoor plumbing, when chamber pots were emptied onto any thoroughfare out of second story windows. <laughs> See that thunder mug? Aguas. It has the advantage of recognizing that danger and or humiliation descend out of nowhere on the unwary. We all know the humiliation and danger that borders generate, especially the more portable ones. Consider the morning of our January raid. Right here, 1,500 miles north of where U.S. maps say the border is, dozens of my neighbors in Mill Pond Manor are out in the street with their hands flex a cup behind their backs. At one trailer after another, uniformed men swarm up the front steps. He's holding his right arm stiff at his side. Policia, abran. You hear the sound of wood breaking. Women shriek into cell phones for cousins or sisters-in-law to come for their kids. A teenage girl stands in pajamas and handcuffs in a driveway. A guy late for work, car keys in one hand, is ordered back to his trailer at gunpoint. Children at gunpoint watch the drawers emptied on the floor, clothing thrown out of closets. With their mother bent over a car hood, out front, two little kids run out of a house and off through the snow and underwear and stockings. No telling what parts of that moment stick in your mind, what smells, noises from it, what remarks about it. One neighbor recalls that all that day she thought about was flap, flap, the sound of helicopter blades in the air. What did it remind her of? It was the noise which broke her at 5.30 a.m. It was unearthly, not the hum of propellers, more like the sound of cards slapped on a table, flap, flap. A sound so thick you felt it on your skin, so heavy you saw faces distort to be heard. That sound ate into her mind. What did she, what did it recall? Finally, she remembered. The sound came from when she was a kid, from the corner of Tianguis, or market, when a senora would toss a throat-cut chicken into a steel drum. Flap, 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 flap. Time flies sideways. Gracias. <laughs> La lobita. Uh, the whole raid took two, maybe three hours. But after a few more hours, people cannot quite tell what they heard from what they heard described. One thing sure, when those patrol cars pulled off into the distance, a terrible quiet took over. A door hung on broken hinges, the uh, keys dangled in an ignition car. The whole parqueadero lay wide open as a victim. People picked up their kids at school and fled by noon. A few days later, nobody will answer their front door. We live in a very foreign country, many of my neighbors remind each other. At the downtown Funeraria, for example, the guy will cremate you for free, but if your family wants the ashes, he charges $1,500. Although, bueno, la neta, that may not be true, but thinking that way does align with one grain of current feeling that everybody thinks that everybody else thinks that greedy locals take advantage of us. Que así son los güeros, así son metálicos a morir. Sure, of course, 45 years ago it was different. If you guys would walk across the border at night, each with a bundle of weed on his back, you would hear them before they left. They would say, ayúdame chui. They were asking the favor of Jesus Malverde patron of Mexicano smugglers, a fellow who had the bad fortune to be caught and killed in 1909. Today's narcos don't mention it, of course, or I think they don't. Nowadays, it is cocaine that crosses the border, tucked in, between, tucked in the form of 100-pound bricks, but the stories keep right on coming. 45 years ago, you might have thought those guys were asking the aid of Jesucristo whose nickname also happens to be Chewy. Because yet, 
among Mexicanos, even God has a nickname. It was a neighbor who convinced me that living with wider borders, inhabiting a more varied world, intensifies your feel for where you are from. Don't my more widely traveled friends feel different than I do about where we live? Different, I mean, about this scrap of windy sagebrush we awaken every morning? Calls for a particular kind of humor. Practically, until the day she died, my buddy Virginia was laughing at the reaction of Ron Fairley, that wuss announcer for the Mariners, she called him, one afternoon when a tremor swept through the kingdom. Earthquake, I'm out of here, said Ron, followed by camera trained on empty chair. Whenever Virginia would Google, pardon me, would giggle at unexpected moments at a reading or in a restaurant and mutter, Earthquake, I'm out of here. I figured it was how she kept her emphysema and her Alzheimer's at arm's length at the mercy of her laughter. Boundaries and separation, she liked to exist, are what make local news different from the national, the domestic product different from the import. Neighbors, for her, were the people you see on your, out your window. And that makes sense. Check the genetics of that word neighbor. The nay part of it is cousin to the words near and nigh and next, while the boar, apparently unrelated to burrow and burrow and bird, is cousin to bower and more distantly to what Wikipedia calls the most common and most irregular verb in modern English, to be. Neighbors, in short, are those who live nearby, global village arguments notwithstanding. You can leave family and Facebook behind, to be sure, but your neighbors, boy our neighbors are, says worlds about you. And what were the immediate effects of our local ice raid? Everybody has a bigger, uh, probably a trigger image, a driveway or a cottonwood bow, a basketball hoop nailed to a phone pole, an empty dog collar chained to a cinder block. That is how memory rings grief and glee and terror out of the ordinary objects people have lived among for years, out of a lot of hyper cheesy stuff that overnight looks different. The objects look posed, even rehearsed, like a front page photo after 15 years. Life tips back and forth up here till you get nabbed one night and next afternoon in Tacoma sign the voluntary deportation order and you feel like a soap bubble. A slippery existence. Later it emerges that 16 of those charged here or <clears throat> taken here are charged with the crime of using forged documents. They were working under a social security number assigned to someone else, which is not a crime, not an arrest, and doesn't oblige the officer who detains you to permit you so much as a phone call. Take a deep breath. You're under arrest for existing on the wrong side of an imaginary line. Welcome to the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma. In morning rain, a squat, tan building of two stories covering what looks like a whole city block and surrounded by wire mesh fencing eight feet high, it wears a GEO logo. Our goal, says their brochure, is to help our clients serve those assigned to their care through a wide range of design, construction and financing of state and federal prisons, immigration and detention centers. Pick up a visitor tag at the front door, leave a wallet and jacket, and cell phone in a locker, ascend with driver's license in one pocket to an upstairs room with 12 chairs bolted to the floor, 18 people, a few sitting on the floor, Mexicanos, but for a Salvadoreño and two guys from the Gambia speaking what turns out to be Mandingo. Chill, chill, sit on the floor. Finally, on a chair from two till six for 10 minutes of paperwork, then wait till eight in the van out front. Compare what, pardon me, compare bonds that vary from 5,000 to $25,000. Hence the wad of bills 
My neighbor carried into the bank in a plastic bread wrapper and turned into two cashier's checks for $5,000 each. Wait out front in the van. Eight buses pull up at the gate, get buzzed through, and unload people. By 8.15, two sisters walk out in tears and climb in the van. On the way back, here is a third sister, relieved, joking, recalling her reaction in the first moment of the raid. Remember when Hurricane Paulita hit Acapulco? Well, that was the night I learned not to sleep in the nude. So this time, I hear the commotion outside, and I look out the window and run out in pajamas with my hair all granulo and without a bra and... Wait a minute, somebody wonders out loud. Who traumatized who? <laughs> the short-term effect on the neighborhood is obvious. No one will ever feel the same about these porches, this highway, these trees. From now on, file away in dozens of people's collective memory, behind long pauses tucked among a lot of piñatas and quinceañeras, baptisms, funerals, graduations, and weddings, there now exists that one morning of gray sky and helicopter noises. Words like shame and humiliation didn't come until much later. At first, it was only the shock on the faces of people from work and church and the supermarket, people looking at you as if you were naked. And the long-term effects? That is where shame and humiliation come in. You started to feel like the person you were was a joke. What was your neighborhood, 15 years after all, vanished at a knock on the door? Look around you. See those steps? Remember that dreadful, awkward, panicky moment with eight or ten guys tilting the casket of Doña Elida to ease it in the front door? Remember her weeping older brother, the one she thought in her delirium was a devil? Remember the old church pews brought to the front yard to sit in? The younger daughter on a pew by the driveway weeping so hard she vomited? And the older boy, disdainful, a convert to whatever faith it was, the Reverend Witty Martinez was ringing out a holy writ every Sunday morning in that converted farmhouse. Remember? Well, none of it happened. So, that's what I've got to say. Let's look here at, finally, could you fold up? You want me to get the other one? Yeah, I want the painting. I want to close with a few observations on the painting that the cover of the book features. It's called a Costa painting. It comes from 1750. From 1550, painters in Spain made a great living satisfying the curiosity of Spaniards. Those Spaniards wanted to know what that new world looked like. And here, uh, this fellow has painted one of the most famous ones. Look at the, you see the, the, the painting is in three parts. Here at the bottom we have, as you can see, a little clearer you can see they're actually named down here, the fruits typical to the new world, fruits that don't exist in Spain. So what do we have here? Avocados, for instance, and mangoes, I believe, and so forth. In the middle, we have these, what, one, two, three, four panels, is it? Eight panels. People in Spain were curious, not just what kind of fruit grew on trees that they'd never seen before, but also what kind of people existed in this new world. And so what you'll see here is that by each, each frame there is composed of a child and two adults. The child, we're given to understand is the result, what the, res uh, the way the offspring of those two adults would appear. Is it uh, impressive? Yeah. Does it, uh, was it useful? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's historical contemporary records that suggest that 
people could keep 16 different divisions for human beings straight in there with some argument. So and so came by, what did he look like? He was a MSD. So, no, he was an ultraman or something like this. But generally speaking, people kept them straight. So, I put this on the cover of the book as a kind of an illustration of how our thinking about each other can go so terribly wrong. It turns out that uh, when we look at something like this, there's zillions of devices like this now to tell you what only genetically who you are, what you like. The answer always is one form or another of when Jesus sees that man and he wanted to cast the spirit out of him. And Jesus said to that spirit, what's Jesus got to know before he can make the spirit leave? Got to know the name of the spirit. And the spirit says what? There's a lot of us. We're easy. And you know, it's just for good measure. In the New Testament, Jesus and the, and the spirit were speaking Aramaic. But the spirit uses a Latin word, a foreign word, a newly, what, um, a, a word that signals that we become part of a new, uh, part of a newly established empire, yeah? We're a legion, he says. There's a lot of us. That's the answer. You're going to get, whether it's out of a 16th century Costa painting, or whether it's out of the saliva in your mouth that you come up with, <laughs> for a DNA test. Those devices are wonderful. They're marvelous. But they're deceptive in the long run. What did Jesus say? What did that big say to Jesus? There's a lot of us. There's no single one of us. Hmm? Thank you for coming. Have a great afternoon. Places like the Great Plains and the Mexican Central plateau. So the mixed feelings come about in the book in the sense that, after all, anybody's got mixed feelings about where he or she is from. But my neighbors and me, in particular, because we're from a long way away from here. That is to say, in other words, we've managed to settle in a part of the country that's undergone two major immigrant invasion since 1930. since he's 